Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tyro MBS. Um, I am Mark Erkin coming to you from New York, along with my co-host, uh, JP Brito, who is um, out in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and uh, we have an outstanding program this morning um, that uh, has uh, two outstanding um, physicians who will be presenting. Um, first, uh, Dr. Natalia um, Gennari is a um, it's really a pleasure to introduce you um, to our audience. She is an assistant professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism, and Lipid Research at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, Dr. Gennari's clinical interests are in thyroid and adrenal disease. She has published in the areas of clinical decision making in thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. Um, uh, as well as thyroid cancer epidemiology. She is a member of the editorial boards of Clinical Thyroidology, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology, and Metabolism Case Reports. And we have the real, the extreme honor this morning of having as our discussant um, someone who needs no introduction. Dr. David Cooper is well known to all of the, um, the thyroid world. He is a professor of medicine and radiology at uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's also professor of international health at the Bloomberg John Hopkins School of Public Health, <clears throat> an editor of um, a textbook that should be under everyone's uh, pillow or on their nightstand, uh, Werner's and Ingbar's textbook of the thyroid. He's also, also um, an editor of two other textbooks entitled Medical Management of Thyroid Disease and Thyroid Cancer. Dr. Cooper was chair of the ATA task force in, in 2006 and 2009 that first drafted the, the ATA's clinical practice guidelines for thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. He's past president of the ATA and the recipient of numerous awards from the ATA, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the Endocrine Society. And this is um, uh, um, the topic this morning is uh, uh, one that um, I hope uh, will generate a lot of questions and um, tremendous interest. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn over the platform uh, to Dr. Gennari and um, everyone as usual, please make sure you send in your questions. We'll do our best to get to those uh, by the end of the hour. Natalia. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, thank you so much for having me um, and for the kind introduction, I will go ahead and get started. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, my only disclosure is that I'm not an author of this paper, um, but I will be discussing uh, the methodology with you today. And of course, what we will be discussing today is uh, Estimable 2, which is a large trial that came out earlier this year in March from uh, at, in the New England Journal of Medicine from colleagues at Gustave Rousseau and their collaborators from across France. And this trial really looks at patients with small, low-risk thyroid cancers who undergo a total thyroidectomy. To me, um, and how um, recurrences may be impacted by non radioiodine ablation versus 30 millicuri iodine ablation uh, postoperatively. So I'll take the, the next few slides really to talk about the evolution of the data leading up to this trial, um, and then um, follow that off with the nuts and bolts of the, the methodology used. Oops. Um, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so in order to put the, uh, impo the importance of this issue in perspective um, and the topic of small thyroid cancers, I think we really need to start with epidemiology. And this is really nicely highlighted by doctors um, Lim um, and Kitahara in, in this study uh, from JAMA in 2017 um, on the left-hand side of my slide. Um, and this is a look through the SEER database at the last 50 years um, or so of thyroid cancer uh, incidence. And on the y-axis, we have a logarithmic uh, scale. And what we can see, this uh, line in black here in tumor size represents tumors less than one centimeter in size and pink uh, 
one to two centimeters in size. Uh, and these really represent the, the largest rate of increase in the bulk of thyroid cancer diagnoses in the United States. Um, now on the right side of the screen, this is actually a similar cohort study called Fransom, uh, through the Fransom can uh, Cancer Registry, which accounts for about 25% of the metropolitan French population. And this is over about 10 years time from 2008 to 2016. And we can see that about 70% of all the tumors diagnosed over this time are these small, less than two centimeter uh, in size thyroid cancers. Um, so the scope of this issue is really quite large. Now, I've mentioned T1 a couple times. I just want to summarize the approach uh, for new diagnosis thyroid cancer since this is this will be the topic of conversation today. And of course, I know many, many people in this room know this already. Um, and based so the 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 AJCC8 um, cancer staging system came out uh, a little bit after the 2015 um, ATK guidelines, and that's what I have on the slide here. So of course, when we diagnose uh, thyroid cancer, we um, evaluate some of the gross features of this tu the tumor, including size, uh, nodal status, and uh, presence of metastatic disease. Um, and, to, and, and this translates um, along with age to a specific um, range of, of survival and prognostic, um, prognostic indicators. Um, when we look uh, specifically for the purposes of this trial, we're really looking at T1 tumors. So these are tumors less than two centimeters in size limited to the thyroid. Um, and the trial included both NX and N0 tumors, um, meaning uh, NX that the, the lymph node status couldn't be assessed or um, there was no uh, pathologic or clinical evidence of um, nodal metastases. And in these, uh, tumors, uh, the 2015 guidelines recommend options uh, as far as extent of surgery for both uh, total thyroidectomy and lobectomy. Now, um, the, the other part of uh, upfront evaluation of, of thyroid cancer, it also includes um, not just the gross features of disease, but some of the pathologic features of disease that, that can really help us predict uh, the risk of recurrence based on the ATA uh, risk stratification system. Um, and the ATA separates this by into low, uh, intermediate risk, and high risk for recurrence. Um, with low risk disease uh, carrying about a 5% risk of recurrence. Uh, and for papillary thyroid cancer, some of these microscopic features include absence of um, extrathyroidal extension, um, lymphovascular invasion, presence of um, aggressive histology, and either um, no nodal disease or micrometastatic uh, disease. Um, and so, the, this is part of um, the early evaluation for, for thyroid cancer, and, and some of these uh, risks are further augmented by response to therapy. We're going to talk about that a little while later um, in the presentation. So what do we do with a small low-risk thyroid cancer uh, once we diagnose it? So for these uh, low-risk thyroid cancers, the current guidelines are that uh, remnant ablation is not routinely recommended after thyroidectomy, although some um, individual considerations uh, based on uh, patient factors, patient preferences, uh, and other factors um, that may be relevant to the patient. Um, however, um, based on the data available up to the 2015 guidelines, this was deemed a, a weak recommendation based on the quality of evidence. Um, and I think for me, the, the way that I split up uh, the question of what to do with these low-risk uh, thyroid cancers um, is sort of split based on evidence uh, in two different buckets. One bucket being, okay, well, in the rare case that we give radioactive iodine, which dose of iodine would we give? Um, and two, whether any iodine is needed at all.
Um, and the first question uh, is a is very nicely addressed uh, in two randomized trials uh, that came out the same month in New England Journal of Medicine in 2012. These are, of course, the HILO trial and the Estimable One trial. And these in, in the UK and France, respectively, enrolled a large cohort of patients that were um, block randomized to recombinant, uh, to thyrogen stimulated versus withdrawal um, stimulated protocols and high uh, and low dose uh, iodine ablation. And these trials both really looked at the success of ablation um, over time, um, rather than the question of events or occurrence rates in, in the present trial that we'll be discussing. And these found uh, very similar rates with uh, uh, of success with a different approaches and with lower dosing of radioactive iodine. And so in many centers now, um, the 30 millicurie dosing has become quite standard if ablation uh, is beneficial. And um, as you can see, many um, blue patients were, were uh, T1, so small uh, thyroid cancers like what we're talking about today. Now, the topic of um, radioactive iodine avoidance is a little bit uh, more tricky, and that's because uh, the, the data for the recommendation is based primarily on large but observational data sets. And so um, two examples of this would be um, a, retro a large retrospective study that followed 1,300 patients for about 10 years. Um, and most of these had a total thyroidectomy. About two thirds had radioactive iodine and one third um, did not. And on multivariate analysis, there was no difference in survival between, um, between these two groups. Now, um, spe specifically patients who, who got radioactive iodine actually had somewhat worse survival. And that is very likely um, based on the tumor characteristics that prompted radioactive iodine use to begin with. Uh, at the time of the 2015 guidelines, the, the publication um, for prospective observational data uh, from the National Thyroid Cancer Treatment Cooperative Study Group, um, at that time had about 5,000 patients enrolled that had about six years of follow-up. And again, most of these patients had total thyroidectomy as well as radioactive iodine. And again, um, had no difference in overall survival, though possibly some, some features that prompted radioactive iodine may have impacted uh, disease-free survival. Um, and so retrospective or observational prospective evidence at this point doesn't say much to support the use of radioactive iodine, but of course, uh, or that it impacts mortality or even risk of recurrence. Um, but how does that impact um, actual clinical practice? How do these guidelines play out? And this has been a, a recent topic of interest. There's been several publications um, in the last couple of years on this topic, but I'll share one by uh, Pasquale and colleagues. This is a SEER registry study of about 100,000 patients who, uh, like the study we'll be discussing today, had no nodal or distant metastatic disease um, and looked at trends in uh, what type of surgery is done um, over about 20 years duration. Um, and as mentioned, so these, these patients um, would have been candidates for lobectomy or total thyroidectomy based on the 2015 guidelines. Um, so what you can see here in light blue, these are lobectomy patients in on the left side, less than one centimeter tumors and on the right side, one to two centimeter tumors. And we can see that lobectomy still is used in the minority of cases up to about uh, 20 to 25%, depending on tumor size. Um, and this is, you know, in the more recent past, and this has come up slowly um, and, and, sort of a more subtle increase um, than may be expected. Um, now in black, we have total thyroidectomy with radioactive iodine. We see that this is decreasing, uh, but about a quarter of patients are still getting uh, routine radioactive iodine for, for these small tumors. And because lobectomy is still a small proportion of what we're seeing, the majority of patients are still being treated with 
total thyroidectomy, um, which is uh, pertinent. Um, so why do these trends not change quicker? Well, I think part of this is related to uptake of guidelines, which has been shown um, kind of uh, some delay in uptake with many other guidelines from other societies. But part of this um, also can be related to reservations in some um, institutions based on uh, the level of evidence. So based on what I've shared with you so far, what we really needed for uh, low-risk thyroid cancer or smaller thyroid cancers is, is a randomized trial that really looks at uh, ablation versus not in these cancers and how this may impact uh, further risk. And this is where estimable two really comes into play. So the primary objective of this trial was to assess non-inferiority um, of patient events at three years in patients who had a total thyroidectomy without and with radioactive iodine ablation. Um, and this was in patients with low-risk differentiated thyroid cancer. Um, so in a nutshell, th this was an open label randomized control trial, as I mentioned, non-ablation to 30 millicurie ablation. The trial enrolled 776 patients across 35 centers in France. They were enrolled between 2013 and 2017. And these were all patients with T1 disease who underwent a total thyroidectomy and were followed for, and we'll talk about what this means for events or recurrence, uh, predicted recurrences uh, over a three-year observation period. To uh, hone in a little bit on the methodology. So two to five months prior to randomization, these patients had their total thyroidectomy. It was up to the clinical team whether a, a nodal dissection was completed. And two months after surgery, these patients had a, a post-operative ultrasound that had to show no evidence of disease, specifically in the lateral nodal compartments. Um, if there were indeterminate nodes in the lateral uh, compartments, um, these had to be sampled uh, and have either negative cytology or negative thyroglobulin washout. At the time of randomization, um, and randomization was stratified by uh, trial site and uh, nodal status, uh, patients either received no radioactive iodine or 30 millicuries. Um, they used a two-day thyrogen-stimulated protocol, and the whole body scan was done two to five days post-therapy. The patients included were adults who were not pregnant or breastfeeding. As I mentioned, they had a total thyroidectomy. They had to have no active malignancy in two years, although they excluded in situ cervical cancer and uh, basal cell carcinoma of the skin uh, from, from this definition. Uh, no contrast um, and for eight weeks and no interfering thyroid medications. I, I split out the tumor criteria um, down lower on the slides. So these were all patients who had a differentiated thyroid cancer, tall cell variant and other more aggressive subtypes were excluded uh, from the study. And in terms of staging, they had to be either multifocal microcarcinomas with total diameter less than two centimeters or one to two centimeter uh, uh, primary tumors with no gross um, extension and no evidence of nodal disease. Um, importantly, um, there's no mention of microscopic ET, vascular invasion, or some of the um, um, uh, microscopic criteria. As far as how these patients were followed, so they were followed for a total of five years. This publication covers three years after recurrence. Um, and the, the groups between the ablation group and the follow-up group um, had very similar follow-up protocols with exception of the 10-month time frame after surgery. So in the patients who had ablation, at 10 months postoperatively, patients had a stimulated thyroglobulin measurement and a neck ultrasound, whereas the non-iodine follow-up had um, a non-stimulated thyroglobulin measurement and ultrasound. And then uh, these patients continued to have yearly thyroglobulin measurements and every other year uh, neck ultrasounds. Let's talk about the outcome measures. So the 
primary outcome measure used uh, was tumor related events at three years. They qualified several different things to be an event. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, this was powered as a non inferiority trial. They needed to enroll um, 750 patients, and their primary analysis was a per protocol analysis, though they also did do an intention to treat analysis. Um, and what you can see in this figure below is that they actually only had about six to seven percent loss per cohort. So, so really uh, pre pretty good, and um, they met their enrollment targets. Um, definition of event uh, varied a little bit uh, depending on whether patients had an ablation or not. Um, the patients who had an ablation, of course, any um, RAI uptake outside the thyroid bed um, was considered an event. Um, and for both groups, um, if there was um, abnormal cytology, this would qualify an event. Appearance of thyroglobulin antibodies or increase of about of over 50% six months apart constituted an event. And then as far as the specific thyroglobulin um, cutoffs for patients without antibodies, um, a single thyroglobulin level of over five was considered an event in all groups. Um, in the non-iodine group, um, a, a, a thyroglobulin of over two on two different occurrences was an event. And in the ablated group, a thyroglobulin over one on two different occurrences constituted an event. Uh, so what I have here uh, is the um, reclassification of patients based on uh, response uh, to therapy from the ATA. Um, and, and we do this in our follow-up visits based on evidence for structural um, abnormalities or biochemical abnormalities. And I just want to compare uh, the cutoffs that were used in the trial to uh, the cutoffs um, recommended by the ATA. And so um, these, all of these values, uh, thyroglobulins over one and over two, uh, would be in this biochemical incomplete response, um, where about 30% may evolve into no evidence of disease. Um, indeterminate response tumors would have all um, not constituted as an event, and those, of course, um, a much larger uh, majority uh, proportion would would go on to having either continued nonspecific changes or no evidence of disease. The study also looked at multiple secondary um, outcome measures. They looked at prognostic factors for having an event. They also did do a post hoc analysis using ATA criteria for excellent response, both at 10 months and at three years. They looked at the outcomes of the events that did occur. They used questionnaires to assess patient um, important factors such as salivary and lacrimal toxicities, quality of life, anxiety, uh, fears of recurrence. And then within this trial, they actually uh, used all the patients who had events and, and uh, looked at molecular markers um, compared to basically in a one to two nested case control study. And then they also looked at costs and follow-up of treatment. So here are the results of the study. Uh, so as you can see, um, the majority of study participants uh, were, were female as expected um, based on um, epidemiology trends, um, vast majority, 95% had uh, papillary thyroid cancer, and about 80% within both groups had tumors that are between one and two centimeters. Nodal dissection was completed in about 40% within each group, but of course, these the result of these dissections had to be N0. So here's what they found. So the event rate in the radioactive iodine group was 4.1%, and the event rate in the non-radioactive iodine group was 4.4%, um, which constitutes a difference of 0.3%, and, and that met the non-inferiority cutoff. These results were very similar in the intention to treat analysis that they also did include. Um, 
Now, lower down in the figure, we have an idea of all the different events that they found. And there was a total of about 30 events between both groups, eight events that were structural, um, and 23 events that were biochemical. What ended up happening to these patients, so among these 30 or so patients, um, 14 of them um, did go on to having subsequent surgery or radioactive iodine, and there were no thyroid-related deaths. Prognostic factors um, for events were, were a little bit um, <laughs> unexpected um, in that uh, the authors found that actually having below median uh, tumor size uh, was a risk factor for having a higher rate of events rather than a lower rate of events. And, and there wasn't really a clear explanation for why this would be the case. Uh, maybe something to do with uh, the, the tumor, the initial tumor characteristics that, as you can see, did not have to do with multifocality of the tumors. Uh, and and the other risk factor that was I, a prognostic factor that was identified uh, was using a higher thyroglobulin cutoff, which which makes sense. Now they also, as I mentioned, looked at response to therapy, and overall at the ten month mark, eighty five percent, eighty seven percent of patients had an excellent response to therapy, and another ten percent or so had an indeterminate response. Um, now, at three years, these numbers drop off a little bit in the excellent response, but uh, part of the issue, I, I suspect, is that uh, for this specific part of the study, they they sent all of the samples um, for, um, uh, for a double check in a central lab, and so it, there was some missing data associated with this at the three-year mark. As far as quality of life and patient important factors, these were actually similar at all time points between the iodine group and the non-iodine group. Salivary symptoms were also the same between the two groups. And lacrimal discomfort um, was higher in the post-RAI group just at the two-month mark. And then uh, by the 10-month mark had, um, had gone back to uh, no different uh, from the non-RAI group. When they looked at molecular markers, so they took um, 26 out of the 30 or so cases um, and completed molecular analysis, um, they matched two to one to controls. And there was no significant difference between the molecular makeup uh, of the, the cases. Interestingly, the these cases uh, were sent off for a secondary pathosis when they were re-reviewed were actually tall cell variant uh, PTC. Those would have been initially excluded if those were caught on the initial pathologic assessment. So limitations of this study. Um, so the authors comment on the follow-up time, uh, three years versus the full five years, and that there could have been some possibility of missed recurrences. Uh, although we know that most recurrences we should catch in the first three years um, after diagnosis. And they also comment on how they were uh, unable to explain um, the increased event rate in smaller tumors and that further investigation may be warranted. Uh, a couple things that I will add on, not necessarily limitations, but things we have to keep in mind are that the inclusion criteria, what they call low-risk thyroid cancer, is not the same definition as ATA low-risk thyroid cancer. So, so these were uh, primarily based on size and, and gross characteristics. Um, and that the biochemical definitions for events within this study were a little bit more flexible than uh, what we use with ATA guidelines, although the post hoc analysis does help clarify this. So in summary today, we reviewed Estimable 2, which was a randomized trial of um, almost 800 patients uh, who received total thyroidectomy for low-risk thyroid cancer. Uh, and the study found that non-radioactive iodine uh, ablation follow-up was non-inferior to iodine ablation in T1 tumors that undergo total thyroidectomy. And my hope is that 
um, this this trial will give us stronger recommendations against RAI use um, in in low risk thyroid cancers down the line. Uh, I this took a lot of copying and pasting, but it's very important to to recognize all of these study collaborators who put together um, a really um, impactful study for the way that uh, we will be treating thyroid cancer uh, in in the years to come. Um, so thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to Dr. Cooper at this point. Well, good morning, and. Um... Thank you for the invitation to speak uh, to you uh, about this topic. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Jenneray for a great summary of, of that uh, New England Journal paper. I want to just uh, talk about a broader issue uh, about radioiodine therapy in general and some of the background and some of the history of this and also go a little bit more into the indications. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit of history. I wanna then talk about papers other than the New England Journal of paper, uh, Medicine paper and focus more on intermediate risk patients rather than low risk patients. Because I think with that paper now, uh, the debate has, is over. Uh, radioiodine is not beneficial in patients with low risk thyroid cancer. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about thyroid lobulin and decision-making. I also wanna talk about factors that go into uh, making the decision outside of just the pathology itself, and then some of the downsides of radioiodine therapy. Um, this is just an outline of how we think about thyroid cancer from the beginning to the end. You know, a nodule is discovered, the patient has surgery, whatever that surgery may be, then there's radioiodine or not, then there's TSH suppression therapy or not, and then there's some sort of follow-up. And in each one of these steps, there are questions about how aggressive we should be. Obviously, the least aggressive for surgery would be no, no surgery at all. Uh, for radioiodine, you know, who should get it, how much radioiodine they should receive if they do get it, TSH suppression or not, et cetera. And for radioiodine, obviously, patient selection is important. And, uh, you know, that would be for higher risk patients. But it, it's not even clear sometimes what the rationale for the radioiodine is. Is it to ablate the remnant to make follow-up easier? Is it because of adjuvant therapy? Because there may be uh, lymph node disease uh, or disease in the, the surgical bed that might be treated, or is it both? And this is just a quote from an Endocrine Reviews article uh, from a couple of years ago about remnant ablation versus adjuvant therapy. Remnant ablation may improve staging because we can monitor thyroid lobulin more easily. It may reveal nodal disease that we didn't know about on the pre or post diagnostic therapy scan. Uh, adjuvant therapy may destroy occult disease. And then uh, at the bottom here, part of the difficulty is the failure to distinguish between remnant ablation and adjuvant therapy, both of which are under the rubric of post-operative radioiodine therapy. So which is it? I mean, why are we even doing this? So, um, the reasons to do it are because there may be residual thyroid cancer cells, and uh, this would be called adjuvant therapy, and it may also help us follow patients by increasing the sensitivity and specificity of thyroid lobulin, and it also may identify local and distant metastatic disease on the pre or post treatment scan. I want to just talk a little bit about the history of this. This is really probably the most impactful article published by Dr. Mazaferi and uh, his colleague, Sissy Jang from Ohio State in 1997, uh, sorry, 1994. And um, here we see this stark difference between uh, recurrence rates and death rates in people that did or did not get radioactive iodine. Now, it's important to recognize that these patients were stage two or stage three. This is before the staging system we use now, but these are patients with larger tumors and positive nodes. And there is really no data presented in this paper that radioiodine was beneficial in low-risk patients. But people took this to mean that radioiodine saved lives and prevented recurrences. And the 2006 ATA guidelines stated that radioiodine is recommended for most patients with stage two disease, that is with larger tumors or lymph node metastases, and even in stage one disease patients who had nodal metastases or other you know, more aggressive features. But this nodal metastases, I think, was based to a large extent on the previous literature that I just showed you. 
By 2015, however, this recommendation was tempered uh, to say that yes, you should use it in patients who have uh, larger lymph nodes or more aggressive disease, but insufficient data to mandate use in patients with few that was less than five nodal metastases that were microscopic in the central compartment. Now, how did this happen? And here is this trend that uh, uh, Dr. Jenneray, I think, also showed you where we have this rising you know, rate of radioiodine therapy. The green is in patients with a tumors that are, less, that are greater than one centimeter in diameter, and then a fallback by the 2015. So this is 2015, this is 2006. And the first guidelines are written at the very peak of this. And then the last guidelines were written uh, at, as the, at the tail end of this. Now, I wanna focus on intermediate risk patients rather than low risk patients, because as I said, I think the issue for low risk patients now has been settled by this New England Journal paper. So um, let's talk about uh, the issue of adjuvant therapy because there may be residual disease. And I wanna just present a patient, a 49 year old woman with a 1.3 centimeter cancer, four lymph nodes were removed during surgery, four, uh, sorry, seven lymph nodes were removed and four were positive for tumor, but all the foci were less than three millimeters. Should she get radioiodine to ablate the remnant? And I think one of the most important reviews of this topic were, was published in 2012 uh, by the ATA with um, Dr. Randolph as the first author, focusing on the difference between clinical and zero disease, clinical N1 disease, and more severe clinical N1 disease. We all call this N1, but in fact, clinical N0, where you don't know the patient had lymph nodes before the surgery or during the surgery, uh, has a very low recurrence rate, as opposed to disease that you know about prior to the patient having surgery. And I think it's this difference that led the ATA to be more circumspect in its recommendation for radioiodine therapy and to put patients who have clinical N0 or less than five pathologic nodes, less than 0.2 centimeters into this low risk category and change the distinction between intermediate risk to only patients who had clinical N1 or more than five nodes or larger lymph nodes. And so the question is, if a person has lymph nodes, uh, is there evidence that radioiodine will ablate those lymph nodes and prevent recurrences? And I think the answer, even in intermediate risk patients, is no. So this is a paper uh, from the Mayo Clinic by uh, Ian Hay and his colleagues looking at patients who had N1 disease. And you can see in this retrospective study that either patients who did or did not get radioiodine had similar rates of recurrence over a long follow-up period. And remember, in the Mayo Clinic, they use a MASIS score, not the usual score that we use. And the presence or absence of lymph nodes does not even enter into the MASIS score. It has to do with um, distant metastases, age, and completeness of resection and size of the tumor, not lymph nodes. This is a more recent study from uh, the Mayo Clinic by Dr. Hay, which I think is a really important one. This is about 800 patients with papillary thyroid cancer followed with lymph node metastases followed for many, many years. And here you see the regional recurrence rates based on the number of lymph nodes that were found at the time of surgery. And as you would expect, the more lymph nodes there were, the higher the cumulative recurrence rate over a 15-year follow-up. And as you would expect, the more lymph nodes that were seen, the more likely it was that the patient would get remnant ablation. So here, one lymph node, 30%, 10 lymph nodes or more, 67% were treated with radioactive iodine. Nevertheless, there was no difference in the recurrence rates, whether the patient had one metastasis, four metastases, nine or more than 10. So this is the ATA low risk for recurrence group. Again, radioiodine did not help. The green is uh, no radioiodine. The blue is radioiodine. And here, these are even intermediate patients in the ATA scheme where they have more than five or even more than 10 lymph nodes, no benefit from radioiodine therapy. Now, one of the other rationales is uh, or one of the, the 
not rationale, but one of the paradigms is to try to use the thyroid lobulin as a rationale for radioiodine therapy or not. I mean, we think that if the thyroid lobulin is higher than it should be, then uh, maybe radioiodine would be indicated because it means there's residual disease. And in fact, in the ATA guidelines of 2015, they say that it can help assessing the persistence of disease and the remnant of protecting future, uh, future disease recurrence. And so, but the cutoff is not clear, uh, is not known. Some people would say a thyroid lobulin less than one is okay. Some people would say less than 0.5. Some people would demand that the thyroid lobulin would be undetectable before they would say the patient uh, has no residual disease. But in fact, uh, in this study uh, from uh, Memorial, when patients had thyroid lobulin levels less than one, now this is an older paper, so the assays were not as sensitive back then. This is 218 patients with intermediate risk disease. Again, not randomized, but some got radioiodine and some didn't. And these are patients who had extra thyroidal extension, positive lymph nodes, or aggressive histology. There were no differences in recurrences in patients who did or did not get radioiodine. And another rationale would be to make the thyroid lobulin more specific. That is, getting rid of the remnant may enable us to use thyroid lobulin in a more useful way. But it turns out that's probably not true either. And in this study from Italy, uh, where, again, not randomized, but some got radioiodine and some didn't get radioiodine, the serum thyroid lobulin levels less than one were about the same. About at least 95% of patients who did not get radioiodine had thyroid lobbying levels that were less than one. And over a follow-up period uh, of uh, five years, again, no differences in remission rates in patients who either did or did not get radioactive iodine. Again, these were low-risk patients. And in fact, even when thyroid lobbying levels are not as low as we would like them to be, the trend is for them, the levels to follow over time. And here are just individual patients showing this phenomenon. So even if it's not as low as you'd like it to be without any intervention, most patients have levels that go down to uh, levels that are less than one. And in fact, even if a person has not had radioiodine and the thyroid lobulin goes down, you still can detect recurrences by using the serum thyroid lobulin. So the thyroid lobulin is still a useful measure uh, even if a patient has not had their remnant ablated. Now, one of the other rationales for using radioactive iodine is that indeed you could identify disease that you don't suspect on the pre-treatment or post-treatment scan. And in fact, this is true to some extent. So in this paper, these are patients who had relatively low thyroid lobulin levels. This is after recombinant TSH, less than one. And indeed, there were patients who had uptake in the cervical or mediastinal region that they saw on a pre or post-treatment scan. And in this more recent study, 219 patients who had negative antibodies, 77 had thyroid lobulins that were stimulated with thyroidogen less than one, and two had positive nodes on the diagnostic scan, and two had positive nodes on the treatment post-treatment scan. So about 2% of patients, even if their thyroid lobulin levels are less than one stimulated, there may be disease that you can find on a treatment scan or even the diagnostic scan. The question is whether treating with radioiodine will prevent recurrences or not. We don't know, but as I showed you earlier, um, it doesn't seem that radioiodine really prevents recurrences anyway, even if you do treat the patient. So um, let's just talk about uh, the use of radioiodine. It needs to be individualized. And I think that patients who have more invasive disease and bigger tumors and bigger nodes, I think the radioiodine use in those patients is reasonable. And this is what the ATA recommend. But based on the estimable two study, you can avoid radioiodine, certainly in low risk patients, and even in intermediate risk patients with low post-operative thyroid lobulin, and whatever that cutoff is, one or 0.5, I can't say. Um, even if a patient does not get radioiodine, the thyroid lobulin can be used to follow patients, even if they, I think. And, um, but in intermediate risk patients, I think the diagnostic scan might be a useful thing to do to detect the metastases that you do not suspect. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about why people get radioactive iodine outside of the risk factors that we know pathologically. And this is a study from uh, Megan Haymarsh group at the University of Michigan 
where she uh, surveyed 379 hospitals across the United States that had uh, cancer institutes in their institution. And this is the frequency of radioiodine given to low risk patients. And you can see um, about 40% overall in the United States uh, of hospitals treat with radioiodine routinely, but some give it to virtually everybody and some give it to virtually nobody. And I think when you see data like this, it means that there are no recognized standards for what should be done. Now, maybe, you know, if this was before the 2015 APA guidelines, maybe that has helped to standardize things a little bit. Uh, these individual uh, physicians, uh, workers also surveyed uh, doctors in these hospitals. And they asked what factors were important in treating patients with radioactive iodine postoperatively. And uh, what they found was, as you might expect, the extent of disease, adequacy of surgical resection, patient's willingness to receive radioiodine and age were the main factors, but there were other factors too. And the two I just want to focus on, these are the four I just showed you, were patient, physician worry about death and patient worry about death. Now we know in low risk patients, there's no risk of death. And yet this was a concern. And this is the percentage of physicians who felt the patients should get radioactive iodine, taking into account patient worry about death. And here we have the data stratified by the number of thyroid cancer patients is seen by these physicians in a year. And you can see that the more thyroid cancer patients are seen by an individual physician, the less patients are getting radioactive iodine in terms of even though they're worried about death. Similarly, the physician worry about death is much higher in patient in physicians who don't see a lot of thyroid cancer patients. And in physicians who do, they are less worried about patient death. In this survey, uh, surgeons were surveyed at the same hospitals and they were asked who is making the decision about radioactive iodine therapy. And in 16%, it was the surgeon, 69% an endocrinologist and 15% a nuclear medicine physician or radiologist. And in this analysis, if the decision maker was a nuclear medicine physician or radiologist, there was a greater use of radioactive iodine. Here are the data on that. So a uh, statistically significant increase in the use of radioiodine if the doctor taking care of the patient is a nuclear medicine physician. And I'll just mention that in Europe, uh, where this uh, study came from in France, many nuclear medicine physicians are the doctors that see patients for thyroid cancer and take care of them, not endocrinologists. What are the downsides? So we, I think we all know that there may be effects on fertility and menopause, effect on pregnancy outcomes perhaps, and then second malignancy. But I just wanna go over this really briefly with you. So we know that after radioiodine, there may be a transient decrease in menstrual function and fertility but this is not a long-term phenomenon. There are data to show that ovarian reserve is decreased after radioiodine by measuring anti-malarian hormone, which goes down to the measure of uh, ovarian number, really. Uh, sorry, of uh, egg number. Um, there are no differences in many studies looking at rates of pregnancy and outcomes of pregnancy uh, in people who did or did not get radioactive iodine. But in this study, uh, in one of these large uh, studies, this is the one from Korea, um, there was an increased risk of congenital malformation um, if the person had a pregnancy zero to five months after getting radioactive iodine compared to more than six months. And the odds ratio was 1.7 for having uh, congenital malformation uh, in women who uh, received, uh, who got pregnant within a few months of having radioiodine. And then also we know that menopause occurs on average one year earlier in people that got radioiodine and does not seem to be related to the dose. Um, also, women uh, who get radioiodine uh, have issues with whether they should have children or not. And in this study, about 40% of women uh, were influenced on whether they should have children or not based on whether they got radioiodine or not. And um, it says this high percentage reflects the struggles of patients after being diagnosed and treated for thyroid cancer, especially at a young age. And then I think we're familiar with a study from Memorial published in 2011, looking at the SEER database, looking at um, second primary malignancies in blue and leukemia in red uh, over the course of time, showing a rising rate 
uh, in parallel with the rising rate of radioiodine use. And I just want to show you this more recent paper just published this year, the same SEER database, but now uh, looking at patients who are treated with radioiodine who are less than 45 years of age, there were 36,000 patients in this database. And um, in patients that were followed for more than five years, there was an increased risk of solid malignancies and an increased risk of uh, hematologic malignancies, including leukemia. Uh, the risks were highest for people that were greater than 20 year survivors. And they estimated that a significant portion of cancers that people get uh, later on are attributable to radioactive iodine. And this is just a graph from this uh, paper looking at people who did not get radioiodine in red and people that were treated with radioiodine in blue, showing solid tumors and hematologic malignancies. One thing this paper did not do, or the other paper, was look at the rate of malignancy based on the, the activity that was administered uh, to the patient of the radioiodine. But in this study uh, from Iran, indeed, the larger doses were associated with more risk of cancer compared to getting smaller amounts of radioactive iodine. This is a graph from a recent paper by Tuttle et al. There was a, a, a meeting uh, with the ATA and the European Association of Nuclear Medicine and other uh, interested folks from uh, the European Thyroid Association on radioiodine therapy, just looking at various aspects of this. And I don't have time to go through this, but um, I just want to call your attention to this paper that was published a couple of years ago, looking at various factors that go into the decision-making process. And at the center are the patient values and preferences. So this is what I have uh, covered. We talked a little bit about the history. I tried to emphasize data. Um, of course, there are no randomized trials of intermediate risk patients, but I don't think the data support radioiodine therapy, even in many intermediate risk patients, especially based on lymph node metastases. I do think that serum thyroid lobule is very, very useful, especially if it's no evidence that a patient with a low level of thyroid lobule, either stimulated or not stimulated, will benefit from radioiodine therapy. Uh, also, the decisions to treat or not to treat are sometimes based not on the pathology, but just other I think we all know that there are potential downsides. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Terrific. Um, David, uh, um, really outstanding. Natalia, thank you for a wonderful review of that paper. Um, JP, uh, give us some burning questions here. No, I think these were fantastic presentations. Thank you very much. So um, I, I, I love the distinction between Redman and adjuvant piece uh, on the thinking about radioactive iodine use. When I talk to colleagues, um, when they tell me, you know, why we still use radioactive iodine is because we need to correct the surgical intervention. Um, and they they think about these studies as ideal settings uh, in which you have a very good surgeon, you have a very low tidal global impulse operative uh, intervention. And they say, you know, in my practice, I, I, I'm not quite sure whether the lymph node assessment was good before the surgery. I'm not quite sure if the surgeon was able to remove everything. I have a post-operative tidal global link that is high. I'm concerned about this patient not having any follow-up after this. So I just use radioactive iron as I trying to get the best I can do while I see the patient and then, you know, see what happens next. So, um, of course, I, I do have an answer to that when I see them, but I can also see the struggle that they have in non-specialty center and how they use radioactive iron as a Renman treatment. So, uh, Dr. Cooper and uh, Dr. Janier, what, what are your thoughts about the residual, these thoughts in the community, even outside United States in different centers, that they, they don't have the ideal setting in which clearly adjuvant role is not there, but they still focusing in Renman role? Well, I think the New England Journal of Paper addresses that to some extent, right? As long as you know what the pathology is, and as long as there's no lymph nodes that were in the pathology, there's no reason for anybody to give a patient radioactive iodine, no matter how uncertain you are of what's going on. It, uh, and uh, as I showed you, even if there are lymph nodes that happen based on data, you know, from your own institution's issues, that radioiodine just doesn't do anything. 
And so, and there are harms. So I would push back on these doctors and say, oh, well, you know, I don't know how good the surgeon was, and I don't know how many lymph nodes were. It, there's, there's a lot of downsides. And I, especially emotionally in young women as well, as I showed you. So I don't know what Natalie Natalia says about this, but that's my feeling. I think we should really try to urge physicians not to be doing this, just to make it make, because it makes them feel better. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. So I, I very rarely recommend uh, remnant ablation, but I do see this struggle play out pretty frequently. I see many patients who come from rural hospitals and and we know that there's data to say that uh, you know, most surgeries are done by low volume thyroid surgeons and that endocrinologist experience matters in how um, we we treat patients with thyroid cancer. And so if if neither of those criteria, I think it it's easier to be in an academic center and to to have all the resources that um, many of us on, on on this call have with with great pathology where we're confident that if they don't call it tall cell variant that it's probably not tall cell variant you know some of some of the microscopic features as well but I I also do recognize that that many centers don't have that um, and I to be honest I'm not sure how I would react if I if I didn't have the resources in my institution that I do but you know as Physicians who practice in referral centers like we all do, um, patients often come to us saying, my doctor wants me to get radioactive iodine. I'm here to get a second opinion from you. And I think it's our job to push back on this. And I have many patients who I say, no, you don't need it. And they're happy. So yeah, um, yeah patients don't necessarily want to do this. They feel like they're being pushed into it. And I was just looking at uh, this paper again from uh, Ian Hay uh, from the Mayo, uh, that I, some of the data I showed you, and he talks about the rise and fall of radioiodine therapy at the Mayo Clinic. And there was this huge surge of radioiodine after those Mazaferi papers and other papers in the 1990s and early 2000s. And then it's just tailed off. And I think you showed the same data, Natalia, also from uh, the SEER database. And, you know, I think this was just something that you know, people did, and hopefully now they're not doing it so much anymore. And there are some questions from the audience that uh, we will hope to address right now. The the one question I think, Dr. Cooper, you 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 were addressing the difference between Mayo Clinic study and Massaferi's study in regards to the population that was included in those cohorts and why the outcomes were different. Do you want to comment a little bit and what how different the populations were? Yes. Yeah, so. Um... Again, in, in the Mazaferi study, in those really dramatic figures showing high death rates and recurrence rates, and then zero death rates and zero recurrence rates in people that got radioactive iodine, these were patients who had tumors that were more than two centimeters in diameter. They had lymph node metastases. They were aggressive tumors. And, um, you know, radioiodine probably is helpful in patients who have higher stage disease. But in stage one disease, and again, the staging system they use is not the staging system we use now. They actually, it's interesting, they don't really present the data in that paper on stage one disease. And I went back and tried to find it, I didn't see it. So I don't think even that paper that, that, that starkly suggested radioiodine was you know, a good thing for all patients, um, I don't think they really focused on the, the lower stages of disease. And there's another earlier paper from Bayer Walters at the University of Michigan also, which seemed to suggest that radioiodine was helpful. But again, not in low risk patients, but it's not emphasized in these papers that that's what they're talking about, because they're talking about only the higher risk. Perfect. And, and we're just running out of time. Uh, sorry if we don't get to answer all the questions. Final thoughts. Uh, I find it very difficult in our field of thyroid, and I guess in other fields, how the, how, how much you, evidence you have to show about something that doesn't work as opposed to something that works. So it's, it's very easy to start something so difficult to take it away from practice. And I always ask the question to the audience, if you were from the FDA right now, you were those investigators that have to prove a drug, would you approve radioactive iodine for low-risk thyroid cancers? Or would you say this drug doesn't work? So when we flip that to really thinking about initial proof of efficacy, and safety, it's very clear that radioactive iodine might not have a role um, for many, many other patients. So um, um, 
Uh, Mark, any final thoughts? I think it was a fantastic presentation. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer many of the on the on the questions in the from the from the audience. No, I think this was an amazing uh, um, uh, session here. I, I have one quick question to pose to Dr. Cooper, um, Dr. Gennari, and Dr. Brito. Who makes the decision in your institutions about radioiodine? Uh, Dave, uh, Dr. Cooper, do you want to start? Yeah, endocrinologists always. Okay, Dr. Gennari. <laughs> so this is this is challenging in my current institution, but uh, is evolving. So it has historically been radiation oncology, actually. Uh, but um, the endocrine neoplasia folks like me are now making some of those decisions. Dr. Brito, you have the final word here. Thanks. Who makes yeah. it Mayo and who should make it um, across the board here? I, I think it should be the endocrine, uh, but of course, in in, in in combination with surgery, is, uh, depending on the case, um, I think those are probably the most important specialties deciding the case. Um, and that's how it happens at Mayo. Dr. Brito, I'm telling you, there's a lot of hate mail coming to you from the nuclear <laughs> side. Yeah, Dr. Um, K already, already got the hate. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> disseminating what he said. <laughs> All right, well, listen, thank you all very much. Really yeah. outstanding, greatly appreciated, and hope you all will uh, uh, come back next Friday. Dr. Peter Angelos will be giving a lecture on ethical considerations in thyroid cancer management. I'm sure that um, uh, some of these topics will be covered next week. Thank you all and everybody stay safe.